So uh, we left off last class doing a bunch of work in Excel. Um, before we kind of jump into the next thing we're going to go over, what should you have done before we started class today? Yeah, those two learn smart assignments, right? So it's always kind of difficult. And I know I mentioned in class, but I usually like to be somewhat nice. So I know it's hard to get used to those learn smarts aren't due like at the end of the day, they're due before we start class. So just because I don't want to, you know, I know that's kind of tough to get used to with these first ones. Usually I have to do it set for the beginning of class. If you forgot to do it, you might be panicking. When I get back to my office, I'll extend those to be the end of the day today. So the only time for those learn smarts I'm going to do that. But I do know that as people are getting registered and sometimes with a lot of classes going on, that's kind of the convention. So I will have those open for the rest of the day. If you didn't get on to get those done, you'll have a few hours, right, to, to get on and make sure you get those, get, get on, get registered and get those completed, okay? Um, other than that, after class today, I'll put up the first Excel assignment and the first Connect assignment. So I'll be due for another two weeks. I forget the 13th or something like that, whatever that Monday is. And those, because they're not, the learn smarts are made to be before class, but Excel's and Connects, those will be due at the end of the day, okay? Um, so be looking for those on Canvas, start working on those, getting those out of the way. I'll also be kind of after today's class, snipping out all the Excel parts and putting them into <laughs> one big video file that I'll also upload on YouTube. So as you're working on that Excel assignment, you can kind of go back and look at what you're doing in class, okay? It'll all be there in one file. Any other questions for me for jumping to the next topic here? Okay. So um, we're going to do cumulative frequencies, and I'll show you how we do them in Excel. Before we get there, we might want to understand a little bit more about them. And I'll go through some of this stuff in the book. Actually, I could probably hold on to this. I guess I don't need both my hands to do right. Okay. So Let's say we're looking at something that we have before, like a frequency distribution. I'm going to do the number of kids in a household just to make it kind of easy. I don't know. Let's say this is 20, this is 30, this is 40, I don't know. This is 15. Okay. So here's my frequency distribution. I graphed out, I put a bar for each one of these responses at the frequency that I saw each one of those responses. So one thing I want to be kind of clear on, because I'll start using some the way I talk, my terminology. When you're thinking about a data set, like if I had a thousand different households and I had the number of kids in each one, that's a thousand different <coughs> observations, but several observations could have the same response for that variable of zero kids. So I talk about responses. Those are the values the variable can take on. The observation is just every single line in that data set. So here's my frequency distribution. We've kind of already talked about this. We've created our own in Excel. What if I wanted a cumulative frequency distribution? So I'm still going to be plotting frequencies on my y-axis. They're now just going to be cumulative frequencies. So if I ask you what your GPA is, current, it's like kind of the current semester GPA, but then if I want your cumulative GPA, I do what? I look at every course you've taken since you started, right? So I go all the way back in time, all the way to the very beginning. Same kind of idea here when we do cumulative. A cumulative frequency is how many times do I see the response I'm looking at plus the frequency of every response below that? So for the very first category, that's kind of easy because I look at the frequency of the response I'm interested in, zero. There was 20 households with zero kids, plus every other response before that. Well, zero is as low as we can go. You can't have negative children in your household. I hope you don't. So, so the cumulative frequency for the very first or the lowest response, The exact same thing as its, its frequency. The cumulative frequency ends up being the same as the frequency for that first bin or the lowest response. However, for the second one, right, when we say cumulative frequency, it's how many people had one kid in their household 
or any number of kids below that. Well, the only possible response to below that would be zero. So we would take the frequency of one, which is 30, plus the frequency of zero, which is 20, to get that cumulative frequency of 50. Okay? So we're adding up the current response we're looking at plus every response, the frequency of every response below. So I wanted the cumulative frequency for two. What would that be? Yeah, right. I would take the frequency of households with two kids, which is 40, plus every frequency for every response below that. So 40 plus 30 plus 20 is not going to be drawn to scale. So I get what, 90 there? And I just keep going ahead and do the same thing, okay? All the way to like the very last number of kids, right? So I don't know. Let's say the highest number of kids I could ever see was 20. Another way of thinking about this cumulative frequency, so here, this was like the number of households where I see the response being two kids, equal to two kids. Here, it's kind of like the number of households where the response is less than or equal to two kids, right? It's everything below that current value I'm looking at. Even leave that, those are my kids. So once I get to the highest number of kids, first of all, are there any questions on that before I keep moving? So if I get to the highest number of kids, let's say like there's no household with more than 20 kids. When I get here, my cumulative frequency, what is that gonna represent? So remember, it's kind of like saying this. So once we get up to here, it's like the number of households that have 20 kids or less. That's every possible response we can see. So when I add up all those frequencies, I've now counted every single observation. So those should add up to just the total number of observations in my data set once I get to that highest response. Okay. Another way of thinking about this, it's a little bit closer to what we're going to do in Excel in a second, is notice like for this one, how did you come up with that cumulative relative frequency? You added, 40 plus 30 plus 20, right? The frequency of that current bin, or that current response we're looking at, plus the frequency of every response or every bin below. What you could also have done is say, well, look, I know that the cumulative frequency here, right, of the response immediately prior to the response I'm looking at, this cumulative frequency should have kind of been recording the frequency of every bin below the one that I'm currently looking at. So I could have taken the cumulative frequency of 50 and just added to that the frequency of seeing two, which was 40, right? 50 plus 40 would have got me that 90 as well. So I can always like add all the way back, but especially if I have like a high number of bins, it might make a lot more sense to be like, let's say I want to do the cumulative frequency for three. Well, if I take the cumulative frequency of the response right before three, that was 90. And then all I have to do is add to that the frequency of the response I'm looking at, which is three is the response. And that frequency is 15. So if I'm drawing a bar up here, that would be at what? 105. And that way I don't have to like go 15 plus 40 plus 30 plus 20, which still gets me 105. I can do it either way. When we get to Excel, you'll see why thinking about it this second way makes all the work in Excel go a lot quicker. Okay? Okay with it. <laughs> so um, the book talks about these. Once we have these cumulative relative frequencies, we can graph them into a cumulative frequency polygon, or the book calls them OVFs. I've literally never heard that term until I, I used the book for this class. Um, but it's really we're just adding up frequencies, and we can do it with relative frequencies as well. We don't have to just the frequencies. I think it's a little bit easier to think about. But we can do the exact same process, but with relative frequency. Once we do, we'll end up getting something like this. But let's take a look at how we do this in Excel. And correct me if I'm wrong. The file has it. We did the scatter plot last week, correctly. I showed you how to do that. It's okay, I thought so. So let's go to that Indiana sheet. We already created the frequency distribution. Now let's work on doing this cumulative frequency. So I'm just gonna move this out of the way. 
We had all those Indiana universities, a different number of total undergraduates at each one. And now instead of like an easier example, where it was like zero kids, one kid. Well, now our responses are just bins, right? But the same thought process, the same procedure is gonna work, right? Because my bins are in order of smallest to largest. So if I want my cumulative frequency and here, I'm just gonna show you a different example. Let's do my cumulative relative frequency, okay? So if I'm thinking about doing the cumulative relative frequency for this very first bin, what should that be? If we kind of use the same process we were up there, there up on the board. I said the first response, in this case, the first bin is always the easiest. So that would be the cumulative frequency, right? It would just be the same as a frequency. If we want the cumulative relative frequency, that would just be the relative frequency had for that bin. But yeah, the first one should be easy, right? We don't have to add up anything. Okay. If I want the cumulative relative frequency for this second bin, what do I do? Well, I take the relative frequency of being in this bin plus the relative frequency of being in any bin below it. Well, there's only one bin below it, so I'll add in that relative frequency. Okay. I then say, okay, what about the third one? Well, I take the relative frequency of being in this bin plus the relative frequency of being in any bin below it. Well, now there's two bins below it, so I have to add in two more, right? And I can kind of keep doing that all the way to the bottom. Now, it wouldn't save us a lot of time here with only six bins, but let's say we had like 20. By the time I get to the 20th, right, I'm like equals this plus this, this, you know, it's just going to be, I don't want to have to do this a whole bunch of times. So I actually can save myself a little bit of time. So I'm going to delete this. So if you're following along, you're probably mad at me now. But right, there's a much easier way to do this. The other way I said we can think about these cumulative frequencies or cumulative relative frequencies is we could take the relative frequency of the of being in the bin that we're looking at and add to it the cumulative relative frequency of the bin right before it, right? So I could say, okay, take the cumulative relative frequency of the bin right before the one I'm looking at and add to that the relative frequency of the bin that I'm looking at, right? That's what we did up there. We just did it with frequencies instead of relative frequencies, right? I said, you know, we could just take the cumulative frequency from the bin right before it, that's what we're doing here, right? This S7, that was the cumulative relative frequency of the bin right before it. Now, when I copy this down, right? I get down here, notice, okay, it's taking the cumulative relative frequency of the bin right before it and adding to it the relative frequency of the bin we're looking at, right? So only had to enter it in there one time. And now when I drag it down, you know, all my cell references will update correctly. Whereas the other way, right? I had to add in more things each time and it just took me a little bit more time to do it. But if that way is the way that kind of connects with you, I wouldn't like, if on the homework, I wouldn't count you off. If instead, let's say you would say, okay, take the relative frequency of the bin I'm looking at, add to that. And actually I could shorthand, I could use that sum function, right? I could add to it all of these, right? Okay, whatever. They give me the same answer, right? I won't count you wrong if you do it the other way, if that's just lines up better with the way you think. It's just that doing it this way kind of makes it go a little bit quicker. Okay. Any questions on anything I did there? I want to see one of these cells again or just clarification or anything? Okay, notice when I get to this last one, I said if I was using the frequencies, I should get the total number of observations as my cumulative frequency when I get to the last bin. Notice I'm looking at cumulative relative frequencies. Once I get to that last bin, I should always be at one. Because remember, relative frequency, you're just dividing by the total number of observations. So if the frequencies, once you get to that last bin, should all add up to the total number of observations divided by the total number of observations, we should always get one here. If we don't, we know we made a mistake somewhere, right? We can go back and try to figure out where, but like we know we messed up somewhere. Let's say I wanted to do, uh, Cumulative percent frequency here instead. What's the only thing I'm going to have to change? Instead of using these relative frequencies, yeah. So I could just know that it's going to be the same as these, but multiplied by 100. 
or I could just use the same process, but instead of using the relative frequencies, just use these percent relative frequencies. You're right. So I'll show you both ways, right? So we could do just take these, multiply them by 100, go all the way down, which if we should get a cumulative relative frequency of one in the last bin, we should get a cumulative relative, sorry, a cumulative percent relative frequency of 100 when we get to the last bin. Now, another thing I could have done is just say, okay, I know that this is working correctly. So if I copy this over, it's going to become not Q7, but R7. So it's basically just going to be using the uh, percent relative frequencies instead of the relative frequencies. So if I copy this over, it actually should give me all the correct answers by those percentages as well. Notice these give me the same thing. So there's two different ways of doing the same thing there. Okay. Or I could have typed them all in again if I really wanted to. Um, but kind of using this idea of when I, you know, as long as these two columns are next to each other, when I copied this over one column, it updates that cell reference accordingly. Right, so because all these references are using relative frequencies, if I copy them over, the cell references update. So if I go over one column, everything updates to go over one column so that now I'm using these percent relative frequencies as opposed to just the relative frequencies which that's what I want to do, right? I'm creating this new cumulative percent frequency, right? Instead of the cumulative relative frequency. So if I just copy this over, everything should copy over and give me the correct, correct values. Okay. Unless I froze the references, which I, we didn't do, but. Questions on any of that? Having problems with any of it or? Yeah. Um, so, uh concept of uh, urine signal percentile, is that just a form of, sort of uh, percentage mm. frequency? Is that how they at least calculate how urine is doing in any percentile? It's a little, yeah, it's, it's a little different. If you had grouped data, let me think. <laughs> if you were only given the data, where you could see only the frequency of the bins, you couldn't see like the original data that was counted, you would have to come up with your percentiles based off of this. These like testing companies like SAT and stuff, we're actually gonna do percentiles probably Wednesday, maybe not till Friday, but we'll talk about if you had a limited data set, how you would do percentiles of that. And then eventually we're gonna to get to talking about if we had a large enough data set, we could actually look at the distribution and back out what values would be like the 95th percent cutoff. So we're a ways out from that till after the next exam. But yeah, if you only had the data presented to you in these bins, this is how you would come up with those. Yep. Hopefully that's not the only data you have, but you know, yeah. So what do you have entered into this cell? What's it say when you click on it? Um, it just says, uh, it actually just comes up with the, oh wait. So for the first one, it just comes up with 1.76, but then for like the next one, it says uh, T7 plus RA. What'd you have, what'd you have in S7? Oh, I think just so that's the problem, right? When you copy it over like that, it's trying to fill series. That's what it defaults to. I used all cell references here. This is the power of cell references, right? These copying across columns and rows really doesn't do us a lot of good if we're using values because it does these things like default to trying to fill a series where it increases by one. That's why you're going from 0.76 to 1.76. It only works to copy these over if we only use cell references here. Yep. Which you don't have to, you can enter all these numbers in manually, but like I said, I mean, the power of Excel is really exploiting those cell references. Any other uh, questions at this point? Okay. So I think one thing that we didn't do, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't want to go over it twice, because it's probably kind of boring. Did we do time series? Did I show you how to make a time series graph in Excel? I don't think so. Okay, I thought I thought so. I tried to look through the videos before before class today. So we have this data um, that I left in the slides, and it's got 
all these different years and the US unemployment rate. So I'm just gonna copy that. And this shouldn't be too terribly tough, but like, I'm gonna just paste it over here. If I wanted to create a time series graph, which looks something like this, then I think this one, I had a few more years of data. It just, the table was too big to put them all on the, that slide. The, the real advantage of a time series graph is you get a quick visual and are able to tell a story very quickly. So I can look at this and say, okay, the US unemployment was relatively stable in the mid 2000s. In the late 2000s, it spiked, reaching a peak at around 2010, and then steadily declined all the way to 2019, where we then saw another huge jump in 2020. So every 10 years, we've seen these spikes. This spike, however, we know it was caused by the lockdowns, right? So we were on a pretty good steady path of the unemployment rate. And we saw a huge spike when everything happened. So it allows us to tell a pretty quick story and get a pretty nice visual. So how do I create that graph? So if I have my variable, like in Excel, here's my unemployment rate. I'll highlight that data, go to insert. And I just want to insert this line graph, okay? Now it looks pretty good at right away. The problem is, what is one through 10? I don't know what time period this is. So you might think it would be great if I could just select the year and the unemployment rate, insert a line graph. Problem is it tries to graph that year on here as well. So that's not gonna work for us. So we're gonna have to just graph that variable. So insert this line graph. We'll then left click. So we get this like box around the X axis labels here, like the numbers, and then right click and then go to select data. So what this is gonna let us do it's gonna let us select data for these axes labels, which we've got the data in Excel, right? We've got the years there. So we'll go to edit. It just wants me to select those years. I just select the years. Notice it's already put them in there for me, right? So I don't have to like manually go in and type each one out. As long as I have them in Excel, I can just select them as my axis labels. Now I've got a nice little time series graph, okay? Any questions on that? I'm gonna see me do that again. I think a little bit too quick there. Okay, so this, this shouldn't be tough as hard as the other stuff. Um, so when I type in the quiz, there's like a formatting feature. Over here? Uh, oh, why would it do that? Let's think. So if I, are you using the PowerPoint or a PDF? Uh, so that's why. You'd have to, you'd have to copy and paste these from Microsoft. Uh, programs. Yep. I know it's a pain. I wish that you could copy and paste things easily from PDS as well. It causes me a lot of headaches. Any other questions? So I'm going to just relabel this as the United States because that's their unemployment rate. And then I'm going to make up one for Canada so I can show you something else. I was too lazy to go out and grab Canadian data. So let's say, I don't know, I make something up and you really don't have to like copy this. It's, um, I think you'll see that it's not that tough once we get to it. So if I had like two state or two countries and I want to put them on the same graph, I'm going to select the labels, right? U.S. and Canada, select the two variables, right? U.S. unemployment, Canadian unemployment, insert a line graph, and I'll put them on the same graph, right? Now, because I selected the labels, it also puts this nice little legend down there. And then once again, I'm going to have to left click, right click, select data and make sure it knows my horizontal axis labels should be these years, okay? And now I could quickly tell stories about both countries. I could compare the two countries, like were they trending in the same way? Obviously this data is made up, but are, are they trending the same way in certain years? Or is, you know, Canadian unemployment looks like it's typically always below the US, you know, things like that, right? So one of the questions on the first Excel assignment is, is to do something like this, I actually believe I gave you three different companies and their stock prices over a year. And you can kind of see how each one was trending and compare like which one had a higher price and lower at different points in the year and things like that, okay? Any questions on any of that before we keep moving? Okay with that? Okay, so that should kind of end what we have to do in Excel. Um, we'll kind of progress to talking about the next topic now. And I might, we'll probably by the end of class, take a sneak peek at uh, Excel again, but it'll be very quick, like five minutes and I'm, it'll seem trivial when I get there. So, 
Okay, so we're thinking about these frequency distributions. We can think a little bit more about distributions as well. So anytime, you know, if we created enough bins, we would have something that looks like this. I'm drawing it out very sloppy. So yeah, these bars aren't supposed to overlap, but they look like they are. Well, if I had something like this, if I try to draw a line to the top of these bars, it kind of gives me an idea about what this continuous distribution would look like. I could almost like put a function to it. Right? So we're gonna have four main kind of types of distributions. The first is normal, right? Um, and I didn't go through this last week, did I? I've got three sections and they're all a little different. They're all moving at different paces. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to make sure I don't repeat myself. So I think this was like average SAT scores or I-STEP scores at schools. Any standardized test, the reason why I think it was a standardized test, hopefully we have a distribution that looks like this once we see the actual scores of the test takers. So notice for a normal distribution, the majority, right? Remember these bars represent frequencies. So the highest, you know, the most likely values or responses we see are all gonna be right here in the middle. And then as we look at values further from the middle of, of our distribution, they become less and less likely and become less and less likely kind of equally on either side. So if we draw this line that kind of best fit the top of these, these bars, we end up with something that looks like a, a bell curve. You know, might, might've heard something about like, I heard it referenced before. We also could have something like income data. So this is income data. The last two categories are kind of weird because they're, they're catch-all categories. So it's like over 250,000. But all these other bins are just $5,000 in length, right? So we look at this distribution of, of income in the US, you can see that the highest frequencies are values that are over here on the lower end of the distribution, right? Lower income values, right? But we've got some really, really extreme outliers, right? And so we have this long right tail. But in a class today, uh, I'll explain to you the real reason why we call this a right skewed distribution. But for now, think about if you were to look at a frequency distribution, you see a long right tail, that means it's right skewed. Similar if you have a long left tail, a longer left tail than a right tail, you have a left skewed distribution. So this was the length of a pregnancy, right? The majority of pregnancies are 38, 39, 40 weeks. We've got some premature births, but we don't really have any 11th month old babies, right? We don't have any children born in 11 months. So we don't really have a right tail. We have this long left tail, and so we would call that a less skewed distribution. Okay. I think a more interesting one, but it really relies on you to like notice it and then try to figure out why it looks like this is a bimodal distribution. So if we look here, it almost looks like we have like one normal distribution and then another normal distribution. So this is body mass or weight. So why might we end up with like two normal distributions if we just took a sample and, and plotted the weight of the individuals in that sample? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. If we looked at the female weight distribution, that's actually right here. If you look at male weight distribution, that would be right there. So usually if you see a bimodal distribution, there's a characteristic in your data set that's like causing there to be two very different groups. But if you were to graph out each group's distribution, you'd actually usually end up seeing two normal distributions, right? It's just you graphed them all at once. You didn't know this characteristic ahead of time, although in the weight example, you probably could have thought about that one ahead of time. But a lot of times this single bimodal distribution says, whoa, look at the data a little closer because something is creating like two distinct different groups or two distinct different distributions. Yeah. So is that like a bad thing? Like if you get this and... Well, is it a bad thing? Like, so if you were to work with the data like this, you're not going to have as much <clears throat> predictive power. Uh, what, uh, yeah, if you want to start making predictions, your predictions would highly depend on this other characteristic that you aren't even factoring in, right? Nowhere in this equation is, is male or female entering the, my, my prediction. So if I try to make predictions just based off this distribution, well, if it tends, you know, I'd be very wrong for a female where I might be not as, you know, so it, it, is it a bad thing? Probably better to pull these two data, right? Probably better to analyze both of them individually. Um, but sometimes like they hide, like sometimes it's harder to see them. So these are like, there's a far enough gap in between kind of the middle of each of these. But sometimes you end up with like two normal distributions that look like this. And so then when you like just graph it all together, you might end up with something that looks like that, where 
it looks normally distributed, but it's only because they're close enough together, right? If I like push these two a little bit closer together, it might look like they're uh, uh, one normal distribution. Right? So usually it's like, we don't see these very often unless you have like no institutional knowledge of like whatever question you're looking at, right? Like if I know anything about weight, I could probably have thought like, yeah, I have two very different groups in terms of like where their averages are going to be. And I probably can split those out and look at them separately. We'll get more into that towards the end of the semester. We kind of have ways where we like inadvertently deal with this issue. Any other questions? Okay, so we've got very these variables. We have these different distributions. What are some statistics we can calculate? Put a numerical value on that describe different things about the data. So we'll talk about most of them today, I think. Um, I don't know exactly where we are, but the first one we're gonna talk about are measures of central tendency. So this is basically a fancy way of saying, where is the middle part of the data set or of this variable? When I say data set, like this specific variable. So we usually have three ways of measuring this, the mean, the median, and the mode. So I'm gonna start using some more notation. So I'm really gonna walk through it pretty slowly so that as we introduce more and more throughout the semester, we don't have to spend as much time. But anytime we're looking at a statistic, if we're calculating it for population data, then we usually use a Greek letter to notate that. So notice for the population mean, we're gonna use mu. And then for the sample mean, we're gonna use X bar. And this hopefully as we do more and more examples will become a little bit more second nature to write from this way. For the median and the mode, we're just going to write that as M subscript D for median, M subscript O for the mode. And, uh, you know, technically I didn't put it up here. If you wanted to separate, how do I not tell the difference between a population median or a sample median? For the population, you should be using capital M's and for a sample, you would use the lowercase M's. But that shouldn't ever, doesn't change the way we do anything. They're, they're usually just, we use the same capital M to notate it. And uh, I'm not gonna like ask questions on it or and they won't, nothing's gonna hinge on that, but that is something I guess I should do. <laughs> the other thing that we're gonna look at are measures of variation or dispersion. So the two main ones we have, and we'll talk about a third, but it's not very interesting. So we don't spend a lot of time on it. We've got the variance, which we notate the population variance. So if we're calculating the variance for a population data set, sigma squared, and then for a sample variant, or if we have a sample data set and we calculate the variance, the sample variance we notate as S squared. So notice the convention, we kind of use our, our English alphabet for the sample and the Greek alphabet for populations. Yeah. And just to be clear, like no data set is both population and sample data, right? Like when I'm talking about there's like a population variance and a sample variance, well, that hinges on the type of data you have. You got a sample data set, you're calculating a sample variance. If you have a population data set, you're going to calculate a population variance. Standard deviation, we're going to talk about it later. We're just going to scale the variance. So notice the standard deviation is sigma and s. That's because this variance is just the, sorry, standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. All right, so I take the square root of sigma squared, kind of cancels out, and I'm just left with sigma. And we do that because later on we're going to deal with topics where we you know, rely more on the standard deviation, and certain topics rely more on using the variance. Uh, the variance. Okay. So let's talk about um, how we calculate some of these things. Also, I don't know what's going wrong with it. So any of you who have the, the mobile app, uh, I'm able to have the iClickers working, but for my classes earlier, something's wrong with my iClicker application and I can't get my frequency out. So we're not gonna use them for points today. Um, when Wednesday, tomorrow, I'm going to try to iron out and figure out exactly what's going wrong. And we will be using them starting Wednesday. Um, so some of these will say like I clicker questions. We're not going to be using them today because I can't get the frequency to work for those of you who don't have the mobile app. Um, but uh, I also like to use the word I clicker on the slide. So like when we get closer to the exam time, going back through, that's like another study resource to go back through the I clicker questions. You should be able to answer those pretty easy. Okay. So if I was going to ask if I had five numbers, how can how do I calculate the mean of those five numbers or the average? Yeah, add them up and divide by five. Or more generally, add up the number of numbers you have and divide by the number of numbers you added up. Okay. 
right? So another way of saying that, we're looking at our data sets. So the population mean, we'll worry about this in a second. We're gonna look at the very first observation. Its value for that variable X, we'll add to that the second observations, value for that variable X, add to that the third observations value for X, all the way up to the very last observation. Now the very last observation will be capital N, Capital N represents the total number of observations in a population data set. So go from the first observation all the way to the last, add up the value for that X variable for every single observation, and then divide by capital N, the total number of observations that we had. Same thing we're saying there, add up the numbers, divide by the number of numbers you had. That's what we're doing here, right? The number of numbers we have will be however many observations we have. That's why we're dividing by kind of capital N. Now, another way of writing this, I think this makes a little bit more sense. It's a little bit you know, mathematical, but the other way that we'll kind of start seeing this summation sign pop up, it's just a way to write things out a little shorter. Um, I'm not going to like rely on the fact that you completely understand the summation sign. I'll always show you like different ways of thinking about it. But what we're going to do is a summation sign, this big capital signal is going to say, start at the first observation. Do whatever I have on the right side of this sum sign, which is basically just take the value for that X variable from the first observation, and then add all the way up to this capital N. So all the way up to the last observation in the data set and add all those X values together. So that summation sign is basically just saying this, right? Take the X value from one all the way to N, add up every single observation's value for X. And then of course, divide by the total number of observations, the total number of numbers that we're adding up. So usually you probably have heard this called like an average. We'll try to like use the term mean because that's the technical term, but those are kind of like the same thing. We also have the sample mean. The notation looks a little bit different, but it's the same process, right? So it's just now, instead of going from one to capital N, we're going to lowercase n. Where lowercase n represents the size of my sample data set, right? It's a subset of the population. And then of course, the number of numbers we have now is no longer capital N, but it's lowercase n. Right? So nothing too terribly, terribly tough. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay, on that. So let's say I wanted to find the mean birth weight in the US, right? I have this huge data set. It's got every single birth that occurred in the US in the last year. How would I find the mean birth weight? Well, I had this massive data set. I could literally just use that sum function to add up the entire column of birth, like whatever birth weight variable is. That would be my numerator. So I add up all the birth weights in Excel, you can imagine that's easy. Equals sum, highlight it. I would then use that count function maybe, equal count, count the number of observations. That would give me my denominator. Now it's just a matter of dividing those, the sum of the birth weights by the total number of observations, and I can get the answer pretty quickly. So we actually will work with this data set throughout the semester. That's why I actually have a value here because I actually have a birth data set um, that we'll be kind of, kind of playing around with as the semester goes on. Any questions on the mean? This is for, for a lot of you, it's probably some review. I'm sure you've copied an average in class before, right? We're just kind of putting it in the context of a data set, okay? So what if I wanted to find the mean point scored for this data set, right? I've got some game. It was played seven times, could be basketball, could be bottle. I don't care. Um, got points scored over here. To find the mean, I would simply do what? 20 plus 35 plus 15 plus 18 plus 28, right? And then I would divide by the total number of observations, which here I have seven games. Right? It shouldn't be terribly tough. So usually I would then kind of ask a sample and I clear question here. I've got a different data set seven observations still, but now we're looking at commute times. It's just a little bit different math, right? I'm still doing the same process. I add up all the commute times. I would then divide by the total number of observations, which is seven here. Usually would give you some answers, potential answers to answer, and then kind of show you how you would actually calculate it. So this will be kind of like how we would go through things on, on Wednesday with an IQ question. This would be kind of the IQ question. Now, what if I, as one of the responses up here, had 15. Why can you rule 15 out right away just looking at this, this small data set? Yeah. Because none of the commute times are 15 minutes at all. So my mean 
could be 37.5. I think you're thinking of right, but a little bit, say a little bit differently. Not only is 15 not one of the commute times I see, it is, it's outside the range of the variable, right? The variable only takes on values between 20 and 90. I'm looking for the middle point of my data set. So it should be somewhere in between the, the, the highest and the lowest value, right? It would be like, a, you know, if nobody's driving, if everyone's driving more than 15 hours, how the hell is the average commute time, 50, or sorry, 15 minutes, or everyone's driving more than 15 minutes, how could the average be 15 minutes, right? It's everyone driving longer than that. I'm looking for the middle point, right? So anything less than my minimum or greater than my maximum makes absolutely no sense, right? Uh, in terms of being a, a, a mean, a median, or a mode, any measure of, of central tendency for my data set. So I know it's good that we you know, know how to do the computation, but sometimes, especially with, with using multiple choice questions, I give some of these answers where I can hear the principles behind what you're doing, because Honestly, once we get out into the real world, and even as we move towards the middle and end of this course, we're not going to be doing near as much of the computation. We're going to have like a computer doing it for us, right? And so we need to make sure that we know when like something was entered incorrectly, and the computer is giving us a completely bogus answer. If we can't even think about the concept of the mean is somewhere in the middle of the data, then maybe the computer spits out this 15 and we don't even think twice about it, right? But if we know the minimum and the maximum of the data set, we know the, the uh, mean should be somewhere in between those two. So how do we calculate the median and the modes? So the mode's pretty easy. It's the most frequent response, right, for that variable. So whatever outcome occurs the most. So if I'm looking at a frequency distribution, why would that help me find the mode pretty easily? If I have a frequency distribution with the bars, where's my mode gonna be? Well, or whichever bar is the highest, right? If there's a tie, then yeah, I would have, have an issue. But Whatever the highest bar is, like over here, right? The most frequent response was two. That's our mode. Okay. I want to find the median. That's going to be the observation that exactly splits the data in half. So that 50% of the observations are greater than the median, 50% of the observations are less than the median. So what's the easiest way to find this? Um, well, I'm doing it by hand. I have an eraser right here. I'm doing this by hand. Practice just in case I want. You're thinking about a really simple data set. For three observations. The way I'm going to find the median, cross off the highest, cross off the lowest. The number I'm left with in the middle, that's my median, right? 50% of the observations are above and 50% are below, or of the remain, other than its, itself, 50% above. So I could also do 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, cross the lowest, cross the highest. The number I'm left with in the middle is going to represent my median. So this kind of hinged on I had to arrange the data from smallest to largest to the minimum, right? But I could do this for any site data set. I'm really just looking for what number is in the middle position of that data set. Um, we have a problem if I have something like this. Cross the highest, cross the lowest. But if I cross out the next highest and lowest, I'm left with nothing, right? So for an even number data set, I'm going to have two numbers in the middle here. Whichever two numbers I'm left with in the middle of the data set, I'll just take the mean of the two and that'll be my median. Okay. So a little bit different for odd number data sets. When we use this process of crossing up the highest and lowest, it's easy to see there's one value in the middle. If we have an even number data set, we'll have two values in the middle and we just have to find the mean of those remaining two. Okay. Okay. This is kind of simplified, but there's any questions on this? We'll look at some more examples here. Yeah. Uh, like, will that process change when we have like a large data set? <laughs> so it wouldn't. If you wanted to do it by hand, it's still how you would have to do it. Now, it's probably it's like a function in Excel. That it's definitely not. Yeah, we'll look at that there. Um, in fact, there's multiple ways you can do it in Excel, but there is a built in function. You can kind of imagine how people probably used to do this without computers. Um, well, you would probably, you would literally. 
want to arrange the data, but then like you can cross out huge chunks, right? I can like see here's the first 100, here's the, you know, that's how you have to do it by hand. Get paid. Um, we'll see how we do it in Excel here in a second. So let's say I've got this point score data set. What would the mode for this data set be? So it's going to be the most frequent outcome. The only outcome that happens more than once here is 35, right? So that's easily going to you know, be easy to identify as our mode. In small data sets, sometimes, like if you're doing this in Excel, even with the built in function, it'll sometimes give you errors. So let's say that we saw 35 twice and we saw 20 twice. If there's multiple responses that happen with, uh, with the same frequency, Excel's built in wouldn't know what to do with that. But that's really only going to occur if you have a small data set, right? The odds that in a 10,000 observation data set, you get two responses with exactly the same frequency is very like, unlikely. Um, so we really don't have to worry about that unless we're running into you know, really, really small data sets. What would the median be here? So the process I'm going to use, I'm going to cross off the highest and the lowest value. And then I'm going to cross off the next highest and the next lowest value. Then the next highest and the next lowest value. And so I'm left with one value or two values. And then I would take the mean of those remaining two, right? So that's how we would find our mean and our mode here, our mean, our median and our mode here, okay? So that might give you an actual question like this. I've got that commuter data set now. What would the median be for this data set? Well, first of all, what would the mode be? Yeah, once again, there's only one, one response that happened more than once, which is 35. How would I find the median? I'll kind of show you a different way of thinking about it, but here's maybe the possible responses. <coughs> I would arrange them from smallest to largest. You can cross them out here, but you know, depending on the value, sometimes it's a little bit, you could like miss a value or like, I don't know, think one is higher than, I don't know. It's, you make a mistake a little bit easier than if you have them arranged. Well, now I can just go cross off the lowest three, cross off the highest three, I'm left with one in the middle, right? And, or cross off the highest and lowest, but it's a little bit easier to keep track of, right? And with that meaning of four years. Any questions on this? I don't think these are too bad. Um, the next thing I want to show you is let's say I've got this sample data set. What's the mean? Like well, add all these numbers up and divide by the number of numbers I have. So 10 plus 8. It's 30 divided by the number of numbers I have, which is five, is six. Right. What's the median? Highest, lowest, next highest, next lowest. I'd be left with the, the value of six in the middle, right? So we would say that this is a <coughs> normal distribution, right? This data set is normally distributed because not just the way it looks visually. It's normally distributed if the mean is equal to the median, right? They're the same thing, which happens to be the mode also if it's a normal distribution because that will end up being the highest point of that distribution as well, right? If it's falling, it, it, the only way the median can be equal to the mode, sorry, the only way the mean can be equal to the median is if it's a perfectly symmetric distribution, which means that the very middle of that data set will be the most likely outcome as well. So the mode ends up being the same and everything too. But here we're going to be more concerned about the relationship between the mean and the mean. Let's say I have a different data set that looks like this. All right, so it's the exact same, but instead of 10, the last observation is 100. If I calculate the mean here, I add these up, I get 120 divided by five, so what, 24? Yeah. And if I want the median, cross up the highest, cross the lowest, next highest, next lowest, the median is six. Now I'm using small data sets here to show you this because it really amplifies this, this issue. So if I have a data set that's right skewed, and we'll talk about why I know this is a right skewed data set in a second. What's gonna end up happening is that the mean 
is greatly influenced by these really large values, what we sometimes call outliers, right? Most of the data set is between two and eight or between zero and 10, if you're looking at that way. We've just got one extremely large value and it greatly influences the mean because it gets added into that numerator. However, the process of finding the median, we're just crossing off each observation only like carries the weight of like one, right? Each crossing one off, cross off the next highest, next lowest. So the median was not really impacted by having this extremely large value in my fifth, fifth observation. So especially in small data sets, the mean is sometimes a little misleading because it's going to be greatly influenced by these large values. You know, if you tell me 24 is the middle part of this data set, I mean, I guess, but 80% of the observations are less than 10, right? Only one of them really kind of hold that mean really, really far up. So anytime we see the mean get pulled up by these really, really large values, and there's a few large values over here. It's got a long right tail. So that's a right skew distribution. The real reason we call it a right skew distribution is because the mean is being pulled up or is being skewed by these really large observations. So when the mean is to the right of or is greater than the median, we call that a right skew distribution. I don't think that's in the slide exactly we said, but it might, might be a good thing to write down. But if we've got, right, the mean is greater than or to the right of the median. We've got a right skew distribution. And if the mean is less than the median or to the left of the median, we call that a left skew distribution, right? If we had some really extremely low values, that's going to pull the mean down, but not impact the median near as much, right? So the way that we name those distributions is really about the relationship between the mean and the median. If the mean is equal to the median, we have a normal distribution. If the mean is the uh, right or greater than the median, we've got a right skew distribution. If the mean is less than or to the left of the median, we have a left skew distribution. Right? So I could see no visual. And as long as you give me the mean and the median of a distribution, I could tell you what its skew is, right? Just based off that relationship. Any questions up to this point? So we'll, um, 20 minutes, okay. We'll go a little bit longer than I got, so I'll show you like five minutes from Excel. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is not where the middle of the data is, but now that we know where the middle point is, how much does the rest of the data vary from that middle point, okay? So the first one we're gonna talk about is the range, which I don't know, is not overly interesting. The range is just gonna be the difference between the smallest and the largest value in a data set, okay? So if I'm looking at this data set up here, what's the highest value? 90, what's the lowest value? 20. The range is just gonna be the difference between the two, so 70, okay? It's a place to start. I mean, we would say, you know, a data set that has a range of 10, there's less variation than a data set where the range is 100. But the problem with the range is going to look something like this. Let's say I had 100 observations and the values were one and it increased all the way up to 100. My other data set looks like this. All ones and then one 100. What's the range of both these data sets? 100 minus one. So the range would be 99. But these are two very different. This there's way more variation in this data set than there is here. This data set has 99 observations that otherwise look identical, and then one that's 100. This one has, oh, you know, values all over the place. So the range isn't going to be able to like capture all the variation or not not do a very good job. Of it, right? Instead, what we're going to use is something called the variance. All right, so we'll introduce this idea today. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely spend more time on working through some problems uh, on the variance on, uh, on Wednesday. But I want to walk through and try to talk through the equation of the variance first. So I'll, I'll show you kind of the idea of what we're doing with a really small data set as I describe this form, uh, mathematical form. We'll go back to doing this. Small data set. And if we remember, the mean was six. 
So what the variance is going to capture is how much the entire data set is varying from its middle point. And the middle point we're using as reference is going to be the mean. So what we're going to do is go through every observation of our data set, look at the value for X. So we'll go to like the first person, let's say we wanted to look at income. We take the first person in our data set, their income, and subtract the average income that we see in our data set. Right? That's how much that first observation deviates from that middle point. This difference we also sometimes refer to as the deviation from the mean or the difference from the mean. Once we have that deviation, we're going to square it. I'll talk about why in a second. And then we're going to go ahead and do that for the next observation and add that in. Do it for the next observation, add that in, all the way until we get to the very last observation. So basically, we're trying to record how much each observation varies from that middle point. We'll add all that variation up as our numerator, and then we'll divide by the total number of observations. I'll talk about why we do these things here in a little bit. But the process of what we're going to do is going to look something like this. And you can break this down into multiple steps, which I'll do here. But if you want to consolidate some of them, you can. So I'll go to the first observation and say, okay, how much does it deviate from the mean? Well, two minus six is negative four. Next observation, four minus six is negative two, six minus six is zero, eight minus six is two, 10 minus six is four. Well, I not only needed the deviation from the mean, but I also need to square it for every observation. So here I'm going to square it. Like I said, you could do this all at one time. I'm just kind of breaking it down. So when I square this, this becomes 16, four, zero, four, and 16. So this kind of highlights why we're squaring that deviation. The first reason is, if I were to add all these up, the positives and negatives cancel, but variation from the middle point, it doesn't matter in which direction I go, it's still variation from that middle point. So when I square things, negative times a negative and a positive times a positive, they both become positive. So it doesn't matter if I'm above or below that middle point, I'm still adding to this variance measure Right, because I'm an observation that is providing evidence that there is variation in this data set. It doesn't matter if it's above or below that middle point. Um, I am I'm just trying to capture it a bit away from that. The other thing that squaring it does is it over penalizes being really far from that middle point. Notice four and six, right? They're two away. So two gets squared, it's only adding four. Two and 10 are four away. But instead of like just adding two more, when it gets squared, it goes from four to 16, right? So when you square something, it starts making that number quite a bit larger, right? The larger that number is, right? The example I always usually give is if I look at one and two, when I square one, it's one. When I square two, it's four. So when I square these numbers, it's really going to start over penalizing being further and further from that mean. The next step, I would add all these up. And then divide by the total number of observations I have. So what this is going to be 40. And then I divide by I've got five numbers. I've got my population variance here is eight. So that's kind of just the, the computation side. And it kind of helps me show you some of the reasons why we're squaring it, right? The other thing I want to point out is why we're dividing by n. So this kind of relates to the mean as well. I'll do a little bit more. Um, when I was calculating a mean, when I'm adding up all these values, and I'll do a simple one. So let's say I had three numbers, right? I want to find the mean. This is what it would look like, right? Another way of writing this mathematically would look something like this. So each number, when I'm calculating mean, what I'm really doing is I'm weighting each one of these observations by exactly one out of however many numbers I have. When I have n numbers, basically everything is being weighted by one over n, one over however many observations. So each observation is carrying the exact same weight. Same thing with the variance. Every observation 
is adding a different numerator to that variance, right? This observation is evidence that there is zero variation in the data, right? Because it's exactly equal to the mean. So it's adding literally zero to that variance. These observations have less or kind of evidence of less variation than these two observations were. Right, so they're adding a smaller amount to that vari uh, variance uh, numerator. However, when we're dividing by n, we kind of do a similar thing as I did over there for the mean. We're really dividing by n is kind of like each one of these observations, deviation from the mean squared, is being weighted exactly the same, one over n. Right? So each observation kind of carries the same weight. Some are evidence that there's more variation in the data set. Others are evidence that there's less variation. But we want to add them all up because we're concerned with the variation that exists across the entire data set. Right? Any questions on any of that? We're okay with this? At least as an introduction to the variance and starting to think about it. Um, what would a data set look like if I had a variance of zero? Yeah. All sixes. Well, yeah, it was this, yeah, all the same number, right? Basically, every observation would have to add a zero to that numerator, which would mean every observation is not any different than the mean, which would mean every observation has to be the exact same number. Okay? So the lowest we could ever see, right, a data set with no variation, all sixes, all ones, all whatever, would have a variance of zero. So that's the lowest we could ever see the variance go. The variance will never be negative. Think about it because the lowest I can add is a zero. Once I square this, I'm either adding zero or some positive number. So the variance is always, I mean, and we're never going to deal with data sets that have a variance of zero because that's a really boring data set. Right? Like, what can I draw from like the fact that everyone in my data is uh, has the same income or has exactly the same you know, weight or height or whatever variable we're looking at? So more often than that, you know, in practice, we're always going to have a positive variance. The variance will always be positive. All right. So I'll show you one more thing. I'm going to kind of save this for next class. So the sample variance is going to be the exact same thing. I still look for the deviation from the mean and square it for every observation and add them all up. But because of once we get to things like confidence interval and hypothesis testing, so later on the semester, the sample variance is going to not accurately capture, even if we could observe both the sample and population variance, it's not going to be accurate to what the actual population variance is because it has a small number of observations, right? And if you think about it this way, if I, um, well, if I divide by something by two, or I divide it by four, when I divide it by that larger number, it's always going to drive if I get the same numerator on top, it would drive the variance um, down if I have a higher number of observations. So what we're going to do to kind of safeguard ourselves or like err on the side of caution, so to speak, because that's what we'll be doing once we get to the confidence intervals. The sample variance we calculate by dividing by n minus one, right? So if I divide by n minus one, so if I were to calculate it normally, maybe I divide by 50. When I divide by 50 minus one, so I'm dividing by a smaller number, that's going to make the sample variance actually a little bit higher, a little bit inflated. And that's because we're trying to err on the side of caution once we get to things like trying to make predictions about you know, using confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. So the reason why we're doing this doesn't show up until after the first exam. Um, but for now, we just need to know like this is how we can keep that sample variance, right? So until we actually get there, it probably won't make a whole lot of sense, but this is, there is a difference between the population and sample variance. And the units will be just whatever the units of the variable that you're using are, right? So if it's income, it's gonna be dollars. If it's height, it's gonna be inches or centimeters or whatever, um, nothing too crazy. So I broke down the steps. Like I, I know I said them and I showed you kind of how we do it up here, but here's kind of just a, a way of, of thinking about them, writing them out. So first, you got to find the population mean, right? The variance is the, the measure of how much the data set varies from its mean. Well, first, we have to know the mean, right? Second, we're going to look for the deviation of each observation from that mean. Third thing, square up all those deviations. And then the final step, add up all those deviations squared and divide by n. If it's a population data set, n minus 1 if it's a sample data set. Okay. 
So, we're on top. But yeah, I want to get some of this out of the way so we can save some more time next class to, to work with some examples. So, this is how we're going to calculate the variance. One more thing I want to kind of make sure we go over today is the standard deviation. It's not that hard. It's literally the same process as the variance. So this is the same equation as the variance. It's just that we're going to take the square root, right? So once again, we're just scaling the variance so that it's a little more usable once we get to doing things like confidence rules and hypothesis testing. So we've got sigma and S representing the population and then sample standard deviation. And that's because it's just the square root of our population variance and population uh, sample variance, which was sigma squared and S squared. So we take the square root, squared kind of squared and squared cancel. Right, if you actually like, uh, Right, if I take the square root, that's actually like saying two to the one half, which is actually like saying sigma to the one, which is actually just sigma. You don't have to know how to do all that, but that's that is what it is. We're just taking the square root of cancel. So if we've got a variance of 100, our standard deviation, which would be the square root of that, or 10. So the standard deviation should always be smaller than the variance as long as the variance is above one. There's some goofy things happen if we have examples where the variance is less than one. But for the sake of what we're doing in this class, we'll kind of always be using things. Um, this we'll save this example for next class. But I want to end kind of showing you a couple like quick and easy things in Excel that'll help you give you everything that you need to get through that first Excel assignment. Okay, so I put this grade data, if I can find it, up on Canvas. You don't really need to follow along here, you could probably watch me do this and or take a couple notes and you'd be fine. So I might have this huge data set. So I've got like, well, first of all, we talked about using this last week, but if I use that count function, it just counts the number of observations that I have. So I'm gonna go click on that first cell, control shift or command shift on a Mac, hit the down arrow, hit enter. I got 431 students in the grade they received in the in my business stats course, right? So I could also do things like find the median, the mean, and the mode. <coughs> Excuse me. And I don't have to do this by hand. So unfortunately, Excel doesn't line up with what I told you earlier, and it calls the function for the mean average, right? So you know, I say we should be using the terminology of mean, and then we go to use Excel and they make it for the masses and not for a stats course. So they call it mean average, right? That's the built-in function. So all we have to do is select that variable, hit enter, calculates, the, it adds all those numbers up, counts the number of numbers, divides by that total number of observations, and it does it all for me, all right? Now, I'm showing you how to do a lot of these things in Excel because I want you to be able to apply it, and that's why I have these Excel projects or homeworks or projects. But obviously, on the exam in class, like I can't provide all of you with a computer. That's the, I would love it if they gave us a computer lab for the stats course, but they, they don't. Um, so you're still going to have to know how to do this by hand. Now, obviously, I'm not going to give you a data set with 431 observations, right? So I'm going to keep them small. It'll be manageable. Um, but you can see when I do want to go work with big data, I, I don't want to find the average, this, this mean by hand. The median, we talked about it earlier, right? This is going to be a nightmare if I have a lot of observations. Well, there's a built-in median, fun median function as well. All I have to do is select this. It's coded in the background so that it sorts them for me and finds that value that's exactly in the middle. Okay? Yeah. So on the test, are we expected to know how to do it? Like, are the tests going to just be asking how, us how to do it handwritten? Or it yeah, so on the test, I'll ask you to find the median. You don't have a computer in front of you, so yeah, you'd have to do it by hand. Yep. And, you know, I would say the first third of this course is more like that, more based on computation. We are going to do some computation in the second third, but it's less like, uh, it's less obvious that it's harder to do it by hand than to use Excel on that second third. There's actually like a lot of good principles that you'll learn by quote unquote doing the computation. You're not really, I don't know. Well, you'll see when we get there. But yeah, for the first third, there's probably a little bit more computation. Um, and there's some things that once we get to the exam, we're gonna be like, man, if I knew how to do this, uh, or I know how to do this in Excel, it'd be a lot easier to do this in Excel. Um, like I said, we could have a computer lab, I'd love it, but 
So let's do the mode, equal sign mode. You just select the variable, right? Like I said, this isn't gonna take long because these are all pretty self-explanatory, right? You just select the variable and then call the function of the stat that you wanna find, okay? The other two that we'll end on, and it really shouldn't take much time at all, oops, is the variance, which we just use var.p if you're calculating a population variance, var.s divides by n minus one and calculates your sample variance for you. So we'll treat this like population data because it's every student I've ever had. So we'll select this, we get the variance there, standard deviation, stdev, and then dot p for population or dot s for sample. And I think I've got a slide that I'll probably go through next class that has these all like on one slide as well. I just wanted to kind of show you how easy it is to come up with these descriptive statistics pretty, pretty quickly, right, in Excel. There's no more questions for me. We'll probably end there. We'll uh, pick up, do some more examples on calculating variances on Wednesday. Um, Bring your eye clickers. We should be using those on Wednesday for points. Other than that, you'll see the first Excel and Connect assignment. I'd start on those as early as possible if I were you. What was the